Shall we turn to Ezekiel 37 as we continue our journey through the Bible? God had predicted that when they turned away from God and from his law, that they would be scattered in all the world, that they would lose that land that God had given to them, and that they would become a curse and a byword throughout all of the nations. They did forsake God. They did turn to idolatry. And as a consequence, the moral fiber of the nation was weakened, and they were defeated, and they were scattered into all the world. But God promised that a day would come when he would gather them again into the land, raise them, so to speak, as from the dead. And so in Ezekiel 37, we have the prophecies of God's restoration of the nation of Israel after they had been scattered and as good as dead throughout the world. So the hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel said, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. And he set me down in the middle of a valley which was full of bones. Now, Ezekiel had a vision. And in this vision, the spirit took him to this valley that was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them, walk around them, look through the valley, look at all of these bones that were there, and behold, there were very many lying there in the valley, not buried, and they were very dry, parched, bleached by the sun, dead for a long time. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, only you know. Now, they cannot live apart from a divine work of God. There's no way that these bones could be revived and live. But, Ezekiel knows that with God all things are possible. So, Lord, only you know. You know, if you want to, you can do it, but only you can do it, is basically what Ezekiel is, is answering the Lord at this point. Now, in the previous chapter, God declares in verse 25 that he was going to sprinkle the people with clean water and you will be cleansed from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols you will be cleansed. And then the Lord said, a new heart will I give to you, a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. God is promising to do a work with the people, and, and now this is sort of uh, tied with this promise of God of, of the reviving of the nation, a new heart in them, God's spirit in them. And so he sees the valley of dry bones, dry and scattered, which are representative of the nation of Israel 
which has been scattered throughout the world, throughout the nations of the world. And it is interesting that the Jews and being spread all over the world, there were, there were and are pockets of Jews all over the world. South Africa, community. New York, a large community. For a long time, there were more Jews in New York than there were all of Israel. Throughout Europe, Russia, down in Yemen, Iraq, Iran, South Africa, did I say that? China, India, they were scattered all over the world. And in many places, persecuted. In fact, it was the persecution of the Jews back in the early part of the 18th century that uh, caused uh, the beginning of the Zionist movement when they felt that their only hope for survival would be to uh, establish uh, themselves in, in, a, a, in a homeland again. And so the Lord said to Ezekiel, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Now, in the Hebrew, the word translated breath is ruach. And ruach is the word for breath. It is also the word translated Spirit, it is also the word that is translated wind. And so when in the Hebrew you find the word ruach, you determine by the context if it should be translated breath or spirit or wind. And there is no general rule uh, that you can follow is just uh, the context dictates uh, what would be the correct uh, translation. Now, inasmuch in the previous chapter it was translated spirit, and I will put my spirit within you, uh, if you would translate it here, spirit, behold, I will cause my spirit to enter into you, and ye shall live. And it would be perfectly accepted as far as a translation is concerned. The ruach, the spirit, the breath. It is interesting that in the Greek, the word for spirit is pneuma, which is the same word for air. And we get a lot of English words from this Greek word pneuma, uh, pneumatic, uh, which, uh, you know, pneumatic uh, tires and, and, and pneumatic tools, air tools. And it comes from this Greek word pneuma, which is also the word for spirit. So here God promises he's going to put breath or spirit in them, and they shall live. And then the Lord said, I'm going to lay sinews on you, and I'm going to bring up flesh upon you. I'm going to cover you with skin and put spirit or breath in you, and you shall live. God's prophecy. And you shall know then that I am the Lord. So, an interesting prophecy to a valley of dry bones. Uh, just to speak to them is interestingly enough. 
uh, but to prophesy that they are going to live. When uh, God begins the work, He's going he's to put flesh on them, He's going to put skin on them, and then He's going to put the Spirit or breath upon them, and they're going to live. A, a prophecy of the re development and, and the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Now, it is true that the prophecy was partially fulfilled when the Jews were allowed to go back from the captivity in Babylon. And Zerubbabel and Ezra led the remnant who went back, there was a partial fulfillment. But these prophecies of Ezekiel are obviously yet future. The full prophecies here were never fulfilled in the return from the Babylonian captivity. But amazingly enough, are being fulfilled today before our very eyes. This is one of those exciting places where God's word comes alive because you can look at, at uh, the things that are happening today uh, throughout the world as far as the Jews and the return to Israel, the rebirth of the nation, and, and you look at the prophecies here and it's that exciting uh, thing of just seeing it happen before your eyes. The confirmation of, of God's word. And as the Lord said, and you will know that I am the Lord. Only the Lord could bring this to pass. As, as Ezekiel said, Lord, thou knowest, Lord, only you can do it. And so the Lord declares, I'm going to do it. And so Ezekiel said, I prophesied as I was commanded. Now, I'm certain that Ezekiel must have felt a little funny prophesying to dry bones. <laughs> and yet that's what the Lord commanded him to do. It is interesting that sometimes God calls upon us to do things that we don't understand. And many times, because we don't understand, we have a tendency to balk and say, oh, I'm not going to do that. That's ridiculous, you know. But it is also interesting that many times, if we will obey the promptings of the Spirit, we will be amazed at what God had in mind. You know, you'll never know what God has in mind until you're obedient. And God so often leads us just one step at a time. We don't like that. We want God to lay out the whole program. And we ask a lot of whys. But why, God? And many times, because we fail to take the first step, we never go any further. We never discover or know exactly what God had intended or purposed and would have done if we'd only been obedient. When Philip was in Samaria taking the gospel to them, power of the Holy Spirit working through his life, confirming the word as was prophesied and declared in Mark's gospel, chapter 16. Many people believed and were baptized, notable people. It was a great moving of the Spirit of God among the Samaritans. And when the church in Jerusalem heard the Samaritans who received the gospel, they sent Peter and John up there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the Holy Spirit had not come upon them. Now, from this 
exciting revival. Many believing, many being baptized. The, this move of God's Spirit. The Lord said to Philip in the midst of all of this, now Philip, get down to Gaza, which is Gaza, which is desert, deserted area. But Lord, great revival. A lot of people are coming. You know, there's nobody down there. Why, Lord? You see, he would have had a good reason to challenge that prompting of the Spirit. And had he challenged it and said, well, that, 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 you know, that there's nobody there. He never would have received step two. So many times people say, oh, I wish I knew the will of God. Oh, I wish God would direct my life. Well, he's still waiting for you to take step one. And he's not going to give you step two until you take step one. He went down to Gaza and there he saw a chariot. An Ethiopian eunuch was in it. He was headed back to Ethiopia. The Lord gave him step two. Go up to the chariot. And when he went up to the chariot, he found the fellow reading out of Isaiah. Hey, fellow, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> no, I wish someone could explain it to me. Be glad to. And he opened at the scripture where he was reading and preached Christ unto him. And soon they came to a body of water and the guy says, well, here's some water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, well, if you believe with all your heart, you can be. He said, I believe. And so they got off the chariot. And Now, God saw one man who was hungry for God, who had come, no doubt, from Ethiopia to Jerusalem in order that he might find God and was going home still empty, had the scriptures, still searching. And God took Philip out of this exciting moving of the Spirit, the revival in Samaria, in order that he might reach this one man who, in turn, because of his position and all, reached a multitude in Ethiopia. But logic would have said, no, 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 you don't leave something that's going so great and going so good to go down to a desert area. And that's where we get hung up. God said, my ways are not your ways. My ways are beyond your finding out. A fellow came up to me today and said that he just lost his job. He was working for a company that there was a merger with this other company. He was to maintain his job and even get a promotion and instead he was let go. And I said, well, that's exciting. God probably has something better for you, but you weren't looking. You know, you were, you were, you were settled. It was all, you know, I've got security and everything. You're all settled down. And so God's shaking you up a bit. Those are always exciting times. God's got you looking now. God's got you knocking. And, and the thing is, God can now lead you to Something better. Here's Ezekiel. He said, I did what the Lord told me. And, and he must have felt rather foolish. And yet, he did as he was commanded. How important for us. 
just to do what God tells us to do. And as I prophesied, <laughs> there was a noise, no doubt a rattling. And there was a shaking, <laughs> shake, rattle, and <laughs> the bones came together, bone to his bone. That is, it came together in order to form a skeleton. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews in the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath or spirit in them. Then he said unto me, Prophesy to the wind or spirit, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind or spirit, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds. Now the people have been scattered throughout the world, the four winds representing the northeast, south, and west, the various locations throughout the world. O breath or spirit, breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, again, obedience. And breath or the spirit came into them and they lived and they stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army, number of people. And now God is going to explain the vision. That's the vision of the, uh, in sort of a symbolic parable form of, of what God was going to do. Now the explanation. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. That is, the uh, northern and the southern kingdoms, Israel and Judah. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost. And surely, that was the condition, turn of the century. No hope of a nation. We are cut off for our parts. We're scattered. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I have the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Resurrected, as it were, from the dead, and I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. And then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. When it comes to pass, you'll know that I have spoken it and I have done it. Now it has come to pass. The interesting thing is that they even revived the Hebrew language. You see, these Jews that were scattered all over the world, they, they lost the Hebrew language. Those that were in Germany spoke Yiddish. Those that came to the United States spoke English. Those that went to China spoke Chinese. Those that were in Mexico, South America spoke Spanish, Portuguese. They lost the Hebrew language. But Herzl believed that if they were going to really be unified as a nation, they'd have to have a unified language, and so they revived the Hebrew language and started to teach the people the ancient Hebrew language. And now, of course, you go over to Israel. They speak Hebrew. The papers are in Hebrew. Uh, they've revived the language. The people are dwelling there in the land. It is, it is a very obvious fulfillment of prophecy. I have a set of commentaries that I was reading in preparation for tonight. And the interesting thing is that these commentaries were written 
uh, about 50 years ago. And the fellow, because at 50 years ago, it looked like there was no way. I guess they were written even more than that, 70 years ago. But it looked like there was no way that Israel could ever be a nation again. So in his commentary, he said, obviously, this is figurative, you know, <laughs> because, uh, you know, no hope for Israel ever becoming a nation again. And, and so he just looked at it as a totally figurative kind of thing and probably be fulfilled in the church, you know, when uh, spiritual Israel and, and all in the kingdom. And, and, and he discounted because it looked so impossible at the time that the commentaries were written that such a thing could be. And what God has declared oftentimes seems to be totally impossible. And oftentimes because we can't see how God could possibly do it, we are prone to stagger at the promises of God. How in the world can God do that? So it happened when Elisha told the king, tomorrow in the gate of Samaria, they'll be selling fine flour for 65 cents for a bushel. And the man on whom the king leaned said, if God would open windows in heaven, could such a thing be? He said, you'll see it, but you won't eat it. It happened in a very unusual way, but it happened. But staggering at the promises of God. Oh, let's not stagger at the promises of God. Let us, with Abraham, know that what God has promised, he is able to perform. And I found it rather amusing that this commentary, the fellow tried to pass it off as, as purely figurative speech because, you know, there's no way that Israel could be revived as a nation. But they are. You know, it, it's... <laughs> in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when Peter and John were going into the temple and the lame man was asking alms, and Peter said, hey, I don't have any money, but what I have I'll give to you in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And the man, uh, as Peter lifted him to his feet, his, he was healed, and he went running through the temple, walking, leaping, praising God. Uh, and then Peter was arrested because of the miracle. He and the lame man and John. And they spent the night in jail. And in the morning they assembled the court, the religious court, and they brought Peter out. And, and they wanted to know, by, by what power have you done this? And so Peter explained to them that it was done through the power of the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who those builders had set it not, but God made him the chief cornerstone. Neither was there salvation in any other. And so they took counsel among themselves. What are we going to do, you know? Because it is a miracle that we can't deny. And it said, and seeing the lame man standing there whole, they could say nothing against it. I like that. How are you going to argue when here's the guy standing there? You can't say, well, he's not standing. He can't walk because the guy walked in. And what can you say? You can't deny it. And, and so here the nation of Israel is there. What can you say? You can't deny it. You can't say, well, you know, it's not there. Because you read about it almost every day in the newspaper. Something's happening over there that becomes newsworthy here. And, and so it, it sort of leaves you without any negative kind of an argument. God said it. God performed it. What can you say? It's a miracle. It can't happen. It hasn't happened in history. From a pure natural Standpoint, it could not happen, and yet it did. And all you can say is, God did it. Proof of God and proof of the truth of God's word. 
So as the Lord said, I've spoken it and performed it. And so he has. Now, the word of the Lord came to me again saying, take one stick and write on it Judah for the children of Israel and his companions. Then take another stick and write on it Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, for all of the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another, and they shall become one in your hands. So take this stick, write Judah, take another stick, write Joseph, and then hold them in your hand. And then the people are going to say, what in the world you know, is that? And so when the children of your people say unto you, will you show us what in the world you mean by this? Then say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph. And incidentally, the Mormons really stretched this to make it Joseph Smith. <laughs> there is no basis for that at all. Uh, they they're really are quite preposterous uh, to say that this is a reference to the Book of the Mormon that God would give Joseph Smith. Uh, and uh, <laughs> very obvious what it is. God says what it is. Saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is the hand of Ephraim. Now, Ephraim was the major tribe of the northern kingdom. Of course, Judah, uh, the southern kingdom. But Ephraim was the major tribe of the northern kingdom and so represented the northern kingdom of Israel. And the tribes of Israel, his fellows, the northern kingdom. And I will put them with him, even the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. So God said, I'm going to bring the two kingdoms together, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. They're going to be united again. Uh, at the death of Solomon, Rehoboam, his son, uh, listened to the young bucks who were counseling him because when Solomon died, a contingency came from the northern tribes and said, you know, we need some tax relief. Sound familiar? <laughs> and so Rehoboam sought the counselors of his father Solomon. They said, well, it's, you know, your dad did tax heavily and we've got everything we need. Go ahead and reduce their taxes and, and they will be loyal to you. But these young guys from Arkansas said, no. Nah. <laughs> if you reduce their taxes, they're only going to be asking for more reductions. Raise their taxes. Go out and tell them you haven't seen anything yet. Raise the taxes. But these smart young guys weren't so smart. And so when Rehoboam went out and talked tough about raising taxes, they said, to your tents, O Israel, what do we have to do with David and with Judah? And they rebelled, and that was the division. Jeroboam was made the king of the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, and uh, there came that division at that point. And, and the breach only increased as years went by until they were warring civil wars against each other. But God said, when I bring them back, it'll be just one stick. The two will be joined together. And say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen whether they be gone, and gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. So one nation, the nation of Israel, and I'll bring them from wherever they've been gathered back into their own land. 
And again, the modern miracle of how God has brought them back into the land. And up until three years ago, there seemed absolutely no possibility that Russia would ever let the Jews go. They were very adamant in their insistence that, you know, they're not going to let them go. But what changes have transpired in just three years? Though the prophecy said, I will say to those of the north, let my people go. And, and we couldn't see how that could possibly be. Just three years ago, it seemed totally improbable. And now they're coming from Russia by the thousands. Amazing, amazing prophecies. And so I will gather them on every side. I will bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land and upon the mountains of Israel. Previous chapter, he testified to the mountains of Israel to produce and so forth to feed the people. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. And so God has brought them back, and there is one nation of Israel uh, return to the land. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, so they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now, this has not yet been fulfilled. There is still in Israel a lot of agnosticism and atheism. There is, however, a beginning of spiritual awakening. After the 67 war, the Six-Day War, the Jews were very cocky. They were taking full credit for their victory over the forces uh, of Egypt and Syria and Jordan. And, and they had the feeling of invincibility and very proud, boastful of what their armies had done. After the Yom Kippur War, the, to the attitude changed tremendously because they realized that they almost lost the Yom Kippur War. When Egypt was able to cross again the Suez and take the Barlev line that they had established, it was frightening to the Jews. When Syria marched over the Golan and came again within view of the Sea of Galilee, it was shocking to the Jews. They thought they were invincible. And their forces were being turned back on the battlefield. But when God again performed miracles and for some unknown reason caused the Syrians to stop their advance and for some unknown reason caused the Egyptians to stop their advance, at the time the Egyptians stopped to regroup after taking the Barlev line, there were only 90 battered tanks between the advancing 
Egyptian troops and Tel Aviv. There were only a couple of operational tanks on the Golan by the time the Syrians came there within blocks of the Golani headquarters. But God turned back the tide. And the people then began to recognize that there is something here that is supernatural because they were frightened. They were really frightened because they were threatened with extermination and they knew it. But still, for the most part, Israel is a secular nation. This turning to God is yet future. And it will be precipitated by even a greater threat than the Yom Kippur War. And as we get into the next two chapters, we will see the events that will bring to pass this spiritual revival in Israel and their turning to God. And so in our next week's lesson, we've got some exciting things that deal with the future and those things that will bring to pass the spiritual revival and the turning to God and the ultimate bringing of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the servant of David, the son of David, as the king to rule over them. So they have not yet been cleansed. They are not yet, nor can they be considered in fellowship with God. And so this portion of the chapter is yet future, which is quite obvious in verse 24, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd, and they shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Notice they will walk in his judgments, they will observe his statutes, and they will do them. Paul the Apostle pointed out the error of the Jews in his day, and he said it's not they who have the law that are justified by the law, but they that do the things. Now the day is coming in which the Messiah will reign Jesus Christ, the son of David. And he will be king over them. And, and this is something that you find woven through the scriptures. The promise that God made to David that he would build him a house and there would not cease to be upon the throne, one of his descendants, that he would be upon the throne forever. Isaiah picks it up in his prophecies. Jeremiah picks it up. Hosea picks it up. Amos picks it up. And of course you find it in the book of Revelation. But we're getting close. That's the thing to observe. We are already in chapter 37. A good portion of chapter 37 has already been fulfilled. Israel does exist as a nation. And it happened in our lifetime. They are there now as a nation. So we're in chapter 37 as far as biblical prophecy is concerned. These are things that are happening today and are going to be happening in the near future. Cause for real excitement and joy in the heart of every believer. They shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob. They are dwelling in the land. The land where your fathers dwelt. They shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. And he shall reign forever and ever. King of kings and Lord of lords. 
upon the throne of David to order it and to establish it in judgment and in righteousness from henceforth even forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. That has not yet happened. And, and there, the next chapter tells of this great conflict that they are going to be faced with. In fact, there's probably two more great conflicts, the one in chapter 38 and then the great battle of Armageddon, which will culminate in the return of Jesus Christ. It is during the, that great battle of Armageddon, of which Israel will not be necessarily a primary participant. Israel will be a primary participant in the battle that we will study next week. But the battle of Armageddon will be primarily the forces of the West under the Antichrist facing the forces of the East, the forces from the rising sun, China, and the East who will be moving and will meet there in the Valley of Megiddo, the final conflict. So after that, he will make his covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. The, the world is about to face the darkest hours in the history of man. We're, we're on the border. We're already beginning to see little hints and inklings of, of, of what the future holds for the world, and it's extremely bleak. But it doesn't end there for the child of God. After the dark hours that are coming, the judgment of God upon the earth, then there is coming that glorious kingdom of God upon the earth and the reign of Jesus Christ. And this everlasting covenant, the peace covenant that God will make. And there will be peace like a river, the scripture said. He will be called the prince of peace. God will make the covenant with their children and their children's children forever. Covenant of peace. And then God said, my tabernacle also shall be with them. The tent, the dwelling place, the encampment. God will dwell with his people. And God himself shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And they shall hunger no more, nor sorrow no more. There shall be no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. Former things are passed away. There is such a beautiful and glorious hope for the future, for the child of God. Uh, it, it's, it, it defies our imagination. The things that God has prepared for those who love him those who have surrendered to his authority. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. How beautiful. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. There is a segment of the church today that has written Israel off. And they say that the church is Israel. And that these promises all belong to the church that God is through with Israel as a nation. And unfortunately, this teaching has created even within the church, some anti-Semitism. But to take that position is to thoroughly mess up your whole understanding of prophecy and you get so mixed up that, that you have to start spiritualizing so many different things that it, the Bible then doesn't make sense and, and it doesn't mean what it says at all. It, it's, it's, 
uh, totally left for interpretation and, uh, and, and fancy spiritualization. And when you start spiritualizing the text, it's easy to then start reading into the text whatever you want it to say because all you do is make it spiritual of this what you want it to be. You can take anything and spiritualize it and read something into it. Old Mother Hubbard went to a cupboard. <laughs> can you picture that poor old woman going to the cupboard? When she got there, the cupboard was bare. Shame. The bare cupboard represents our lives that so often are barren, they're empty, there's nothing there. People come to receive something, we have nothing to give them, you know. <laughs> you start spiritualizing and you make it mean anything. And when you start spiritualizing Israel to be the church, then you've got God sealing 144,000 to uh, be spared some of the judgments of the Great Tribulation. And, and so that's, you know, the church being spared, church being sealed, 144,000, that becomes a symbolic number, of course. And then 12,000 from each tribe. Well, that's a little more difficult to spiritualize that, but, uh, you know, 12 becomes a spiritual, it becomes a symbolic number, and tribes become symbolic, and you know, you lose the meaning completely. And, and thus, when they've tried to spiritualize Israel as the church, God has yet unfinished business with the nation of Israel, and God has made a covenant with Israel that he is going to keep. And as God said in Jeremiah, if you can break my covenant with day and night, so that there would not be day and night in their seasons, then you can break my covenant that I have made with Israel, my servant David. So don't fall into that trap. God is yet to work among his people, the nation of Israel. There's a separate place for the church and a separate work for the church and a separate position for the church. And I wouldn't trade my position in the church for the position that Israel has. I'm the bride of Christ. I'm a son of God through Jesus Christ. And, and if a son, then an heir. Joint heir with Jesus Christ. I wouldn't trade that for the position that Israel has. So take the position God has given to you and enjoy it. And don't worry about what God's going to do for Israel. He's got his own program with Israel. And he's going to be faithful to keep his word and his promises to them. We'll see more of that as we move on into Ezekiel. And we look towards the future. Next week's exciting stuff as... Uh, we, we find now just the events that were, will precipitate this whole revival spiritually and will bring that marvelous work of God upon the nation of Israel once more when God puts his spirit upon them. You see, the, the body is there and so forth, but there's no spiritual life there yet. That's going to come, and, and we see the, the events that bring it to pass uh, in our lesson next week. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again for <laughs> your marvelous word. And Lord, as, as we look at the world today, and we can see, Lord, these very things prophesied 2,500 years ago, and we see them, we marvel, we're astounded. And Lord, it leads us just to worship you. The great God, the creator of the universe who knows the end from the beginning and has declared things before they come to pass so that when they come to pass, you may know that the Lord indeed has spoken. 
Lord, thank you that we are not called to blind faith, but you have given a, a ground and a basis for faith in your word. And now, Lord, may we go forth in faith to obey your commands, to be your people and your representatives to this world where we live. And may our light so shine before men that when they see our good works, they will glorify you, our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory.